three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. His name is Thomas Horan. He is the proprietor of the podcast, The Stones, plural, Unturned Podcast. Again, The Stones, Unturned Podcast, which you can find on YouTube. And we're going to talk about a case that I'm very interested in and am familiar with, uh, known publicly as the Son of Sam case. And I was involved while Arla, uh, Maury Terry was still alive on a Facebook uh, group that uh, was putting a lot of information. There was actually one of the victims who was in the group. And uh, I have read The Ultimate Evil, which was by Maury Terry. But Thomas Horan has done a lot of research and new, new research, which you can see on this YouTube channel. We're going to talk about that tonight. So, Thomas, are you there? Yes, I am. William, thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Well, I, I'm delighted that you agreed to the interview. For people who haven't heard your name, can you talk a little bit about your background and how you became interested in this particular subject? Sure. Uh, first of all, I should point out for your listeners, if you're Googling me, Google Thomas Henry Horan or Horan, depends on what part of Ireland you're from. Uh, okay. There's another history professor named Thomas Horan, and he hates it when people get us confused. So I'm okay. Thomas Henry Horan. Henry Horan. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. And that's no big deal. Uh, and um, I'm a professor these days, but years and years and years ago, before I got into education and publishing, I worked as an insurance investigator. And then off and on over the years, I've worked as a private investigator, um, some homicide, quite a bit of fraud, uh, investigative journalist. So I've had some experience doing these things. Uh, and um, over the years, People have talked to me about doing a radio show, doing a TV show, and I was always too busy, didn't want to do this, didn't want to do that. But I've always been in contact with this network of researchers, and we've been looking into what some people think are crazy conspiracy theories, the CIA being involved in drug smuggling and things like that, or the satanic cults that get involved in all kinds of criminal activities. Uh, some of this has been from homicides I helped investigate myself back in the day, back in the 1980s, and I never forgot about them. Uh, some of this is just making contact with like-minded people, and you know, now we have the internet. Uh, and we decided – I've written a book, The Myth of the Zodiac Killer. Uh, what I kind of specialize in is reinvestigating cases where everybody thinks they know what happened and they try to explain that. And I've got some experience looking into cold cases or looking into so-called solved cases and turning over new stones. And so – uh, sort of kind of accidentally did that with the Zodiac Killer case and came up with the identity of the person who really wrote the Zodiac Killer letters and what was really going on there. Got a little bit famous doing that, been on a lot of podcasts. And so this group I work with, you know, we're talking about should we put out more books, what should we do? And I thought it would be interesting and helpful for listeners, not just as fans – but if we could present investigations and some ongoing investigations we've been working on, present them in like a podcast format, and then the audience could respond, and they have been doing that, which is fantastic. You know, They go out and they dig through these newspaper archives or they go through genealogical archives. They just put in the time that's necessary, and then they, they come back with even more information. And so we've got that off the ground now. That's called the Stones Unturned Podcast. And our first uh, – we did four episodes on the Keddie, California, Cabin 28 murder. This was a family that got wiped out. That case has never been solved. Uh, we've taken a look at that. So we did four episodes on that. Uh, we've done an episode with Susan Kelly about the Boston Stranglers. There was more than one Boston Strangler. And now we're finally ready. We're doing The Son of Sam David Berkowitz, uh, some people are familiar with that. He's not as famous these days as, say, Jack the Ripper or Ted Bundy uh, or the Zodiac Killer. Um, but if you have heard of the case, you've probably heard it was this postal worker named David Berkowitz who supposedly heard voices coming from dogs, supposedly possessed by demons. Uh, he's supposedly crazy, and he went around shooting random people, mostly young women or young couples in cars, parked cars, in the New York City area around 1976, 1977. And Spike Lee made a movie. It's not really based on the murders. It's called Summer of Sam, and it's set in that time period, things that are going on. So most people, if they've heard of 
son of Sam or David Berkowitz. I think this one guy, crazy, got a 44 caliber revolver, shot some random people, finally got caught. Some people are familiar with the book The Ultimate Evil that you talked about by Maury Terry, an investigative reporter, who dug into this and uncovered all this evidence that Berkowitz did not act alone doesn't have a crazy bone in his body. He's clearly a sociopath, but he's not insane. And he not only had accomplices, but these people were involved in some kind of satanic cult. And this had a lot to do with not only the well-known 44 caliber shootings or, or Son of Sam murders, but a lot of other murders. Sometimes these are cult members turning on each other and they're bumping each other off and sometimes they're hitting other people and uh, what the true motives were for these murders and things like that. And Maury even thought he had found evidence of a link between this group and the Manson family, right? This weird cult out in California a few years before. And he couldn't quite, he just couldn't quite find all the evidence and he couldn't quite, he thought he might have identified the cult that these people belong to. And things like that. And then he passed away a few years ago. And in the meantime, we've uncovered a lot of new evidence that actually proves, right? Maury had sometimes had trouble proving some of the things he was finding. And so he never quite, you know, some, some law enforcement agencies took him seriously and they ran into dead ends. But we've uncovered some new evidence. Uh, so we're kind of following Maury's book, The Ultimate Evil, and then we're adding new evidence that we found and correcting some things that Maury, you know, got wrong and didn't know that at the time. So right, and and for that, people who don't know, the kind of arc of the Ultimate Evil doesn't start in New York. It starts in Palo Alto, California, with the death of Arliss Perry. But he traced right. the group in New York to, I think it was South or North Dakota, and then and Arliss Perry, I think, was from North Dakota. Or somewhere up there, and then to Stanford. So it seemed like he was he was seeing little pieces of this group all over the country, right? That's right. And between Berkowitz and some of his prison buddies, sort of dribbling out clues um, for selfish purposes, but dribbling out this information, and then Maury and some other investigators, and some of these were detectives. Uh, from these different murder cases were following up on this and seeing connections, seeing possible links. And it, and it seemed like every time they would get close to a suspect, that suspect would end up dead under, you know, violent circumstances. Was it murder? Was it suicide? Was it an accident? And this just kept happening and kept happening as they would close in on these suspects. Right. And there, I mean, I think that there are really graphic pictures in the ultimate evil of one of the guys uh, got shotgunned in the head, a car, one of the car people, but yeah, really vi super violent. Uh, right. Stuff and very mysterioso. Yeah. I mean, it, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> not, not only people dying violently, but it's, it's almost like they're playing games, making murder look like suicide, make suicide look like murder. Like they're playing games with, you know, and there were a couple of letters that were written supposedly by Berkowitz, but really don't match his handwriting. One letter to the police and one letter to a newspaper columnist named Jimmy Breslin, where he's, he's talking about these crazy motives and he calls himself the son of Sam. And this is apparently a neighbor of his named Sam Carr, uh, C A R R who had these two sons who were apparently involved in, in a lot of this stuff. Uh, one son, Michael Carr was big in Scientology and, ran around with a celebrity crowd in New York and, and we'll get into that. But, and so that's what he meant by son of Sam. And so they start following up on this and this John Carr, one of these sons, you know, he's got a criminal background, he's dealing drugs and getting in all kinds of trouble. And so they want to question him and he's, he was in the air force and he was stationed at Minot, North Dakota air force base as a aircraft mechanic. And he, Leaves his father's house suddenly in in New York, Westchester County, Yonkers, and he suddenly flies back to Minot to visit an old girlfriend of his. And while he's staying in her apartment, she supposedly leaves to go to a party. She comes back. He's dead. He's been – he's literally eaten a bullet. He's been shot through the, you know, through the top of the head, and you really can't recognize the face anymore. And I might as well go ahead and give you the rest of these details that – uh, they 
supposedly identified his body with fingerprints, but then they lost the fingerprints. Interesting. And then some anonymous person mailed them back to the police a couple of weeks later. <laughs> so this is the only evidence, and it's just suspicious because the autopsy report, the physical description is not quite the same as John Carr. And it's not clear if this was murder, if this was suicide. We go into this in great detail in the podcast, and more goes into it in the book. Um, don't even know for sure if it's murder, if it's suicide. Don't know whether to believe this woman. Don't know what – right. But he had told people, people are closing in on me. I got to get out of town. He goes out of town. He ends up dead. And this is right after the police and investigative reporters are wanting to ask him questions about his possible relationship to this David Berkowitz. Yeah, and the police were very – the police in New York were very happy to just wrap up the case, blame Berkowitz for all the murders and move forward, right? So they didn't really – uh, really want to look into any larger uh, group uh, in New York City, right? At the time, was it was it early seventies? Well, was when the murders took place. It's the official. The first official son of Sam murder is the shooting death of Donna Loria. Uh, this is July twenty ninth, nineteen seventy six, and there are 76. a lot of murders that take place on July twenty ninth. There's something important about the date, July twenty ninth, to these people, uh, and. Um, that happens in Queens. Berkowitz lives in Yonkers, which is not part of New York City. It's another county. It's Westchester County. But you have shootings in Queens, shootings in the Bronx, shootings in Brooklyn. And and then there are other murders that turn out to be connected to these. Um, so you have different – it's all New York Police Department – but they're different precincts, different boroughs, and you have different district attorney's offices. Interesting. So some of them are more skeptical of Berkowitz's confession. You know, he confesses, uh, and and the whole most of it's really fishy because mostly because there's no trial, and I can't find a single case anywhere where this happened. You have David Berkowitz in front of three judges. These are three different courts. And he confesses six counts of capital murder. And the court accepts his guilty plea, and he's sentenced to six consecutive life sentences. No trial. Now, I've seen cases where the guy pleads, pleads down – to manslaughter or something like that, and they accept his plea and there's no trial. That's right. But I've never seen – Sirhan Sirhan is a very famous case, the man who shot Robert F. Kennedy, where he kept – I don't want a trial. I don't want to do all this stuff. I confess. I did it. I'm guilty. And the judge said, no, it doesn't work that way. We still have to have a trial. There has to be corroborating evidence. We can't just convict you of first-degree murder and sentence you to death. But in Berkowitz's case – and this, this was one hearing in a little room – and there were three judges. He didn't even have to appear in three different courts. Wow. This is just three judges. And this is after just a couple of hours of police interrogation. And then they they take him into this room, and the judges are basically asking him, is it true that you shot Donna Laurie on the night of blah, blah, blah? Yes. Is it true that – and that's it. So we're talking – I think it's less than six hours. It's incredible, too, considering all of the publicity for that case and Jimmy Breslin and so much right. that was going on. The murders took place over, what, a year? Was it two summers? I can't remember. Right. The official murders start July 1976, and the last official murder is uh, one year later, July 29th and 30th, 1977. 77, gotcha. And there was he was supposedly found guilty of six, but how many people were shot? It was like there were more than that, right? How many individual were, events? I can't remember the details. Eight people shot. Um, I think six die. Okay. Um, a few survived. Carl Denaro survived. Um, yeah. Carl Denaro was part of the Maury Terry group, so he was he's still around. I know he's still around here. Yeah. Right, right. And he's still active. He's the only one of the victims or witnesses who's really active in, in continuing to pursue the case. He was trying to help Maury. I've, I've spoken with him on occasion. Uh, he's talked about coming on the show when the time is right and in looking into this, and um, which is very brave of him. The rest of the surviving victims don't want to. Um, there were more than two survivors because. Um, uh, uh, Lomino and Damasi, those two girls survived. And of course, there were 
usually the driver of the car was unhurt. Interesting. It's interesting. Right. It's right. There are a lot of really interesting aspects to it. Like why the choice and why the, I mean, yeah. Why the lover's lane, why the stalking. There's some similarities between that and Zodiac type stuff. Stalking lovers and things like that. That's what the police wanted the media to publicize, but it turns out that's not what was going on. And a perfect example is Rosemary, uh, um, Keenan, Rosemary Keenan was driving the car when Carl DeNaro was shot and Carl had long hair. So there was this assumption that the shooter was just going after women with long hair, but they weren't parked in the lover's lane. That was the probably were looking for a lover's lane, but in Carl's neighborhood, there were no lover's lanes. Gotcha. And they ended up parking in front of uh, like his friend's house and immediately, right, they're attacked kind of thing. It's not this guy who's stalking lover's lanes. Now, the last shooting, Stacey Moskowitz, that was a you know, that was a lover's lane. There were a lot of couples there that night, which is also interesting because most of the time there's no one else around. There's no one else around. There's nobody to spot witnesses or spot accomplices. But some people, some of the victims saw other people, right? More than one, like a lookouts or accomplices, right? Weren't there police drawings? Right. Yeah. Right. For, and for see, the first few know. shootings, the first few shootings, the news, you have different newspapers because he's in different neighborhoods, different boroughs. They have witness descriptions and then you have these composite sketches and they don't match. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, and so it. when this guy writes this letter and says, I did it all. And the cops just jump on that bandwagon as hard as they can. And then when witnesses are talking to the media or, or reporters are saying, Hey, these descriptions don't match. Then the police start undermining the credibility of their own witnesses. Right. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. One of those letters for people who don't know, uh, was sent with, I think it was a sigil from, uh, Eliphas Levy, you know, at the time before the internet, right. a real, a black magic sig- sigil, that it's pretty exceptional that that would actually be attached to that. It looks very strange and odd. But if you know Elephus Levy, you know that it comes from, I forgot, uh, Key to the Mysteries or one of his books. It's pretty remarkable. Right. And one of the shootings happened, um, these people had been at a nightclub called the Elephus Disco. Elephus is like Latin for elephant. And so, and that was apparently planned in advance. Um. And these two young people – and see, what happens a lot is these girls are meeting these guys in these nightclubs and, you know, what young people do, and it is the 1970s, kind of picking these guys up and they go out to the car and then they get shot. Well, at the Elephus Disco, um, the the girl's friends – she tells them, I I really like this guy and his friend is the bouncer here and he's going to give us a ride home. So they go home and they go out and they go out to the bouncer's car in his Cadillac and they're waiting for him to finish up work and come out when they get shot. So it's possible the bouncer was actually the target of the shooting. It, you know, it, there's all this evidence that most of these shootings, these people were targeted in advance. These are premeditated murders and possibly hits like actual someone saying we need to hit this person. So those were, they're spotted at these clubs or night night clubs that they're at. Is that what you're saying? Before they're shot? Well, well, there's there's quite a bit of evidence. And again, um, we go into great detail on, on our show, Stones Unturned Podcast. But for example, even the shooting of Donna Loria, I'm looking at these cases. What One thing I like to do on the podcast is look at a case like I'm one of the original investigators and I don't know anything. I don't know any rumors. I don't know what the conclusions are. It, it looked an awful lot like a mob style hit, except the twist is it's two young ladies. They're like 18, 19 years old. They're just out of high school, going to nursing school. One girl's, uh, uh, Donna, the, vi- uh, the victim is working as an ambulance technician at the hospital where her mom works and studying to be an EMT. So, okay, where's the motive? But uh, everything else points to it looks an awful lot like a setup hit, and most of these do, uh, even the shooting of Carl Denaro. But but at first glance, and Maury had right. What's the motive? What links all these victims together? Later, you have these murders of people like John Carr and 
and uh, Howard Weiss and all these people who the connection is they all know each other and the way they know each other is they're in this weird satanic de- dog worshiping cult. Um, but, but the original victims, like what's the connection? What's the connection? And that's what we've been able to uncover in the last couple of months. Uh, we haven't presented it yet on the show. We have to go through these cases first, but finding what the motive is for these shootings like Donna Loria, a woman named Christine Freund, and even the wounding of Carl Denaro, finding out what the true motive apparently was if these were set up hits, and they sure do look like it. Well, fascinating. And talk a little bit more about, I don't know who this Weiss person was, but can you talk more about the cult and what you think they, they're, I, was, was the, did, I, I vaguely remember uh, an interview with Berkowitz where he mentions the Process Church. I think he mentions it by name. Well, it's funny because in the book, the Maury said the, the guys would apparently refer to this pro, this cult as the children, hmm. um, which kind of sounds like Manson family. It's kind of hard to tell. And Maury and other investigators kind of came to the conclusion they must have been talking about the Process Church of the Final Judgment which is this cult started by these two former Scientologists uh, and one of them, Marianne de Grimston. She's a, not just a former prostitute. She's big in this perfumo affair, these high-ranking British politicians visiting these prostitutes and being blackmailed. She's up to her eyeballs in that. Yeah, she's she a dom- that. dominatrix, right? Oh, right. Yeah, she's, yeah. she's into the kinky sex to begin with. Um, and there's all this occultism going on in Britain, you know, Crowley and all of these people. This goes way back to the British Empire being in India and bringing these occult beliefs back with them. Right. And the guy who was the head of the Profumo affair, I think he was the guy who was handling Keeler, was into black magic. He was like, right. Exactly. Yeah. So these yeah, Exactly. It's there. So, so uh, she and uh, her, her husband, Robert – and they change their name to De Grimston, which sounds very magical. And they start this new church, the the Process Church of the Final Judgment, where they're fusing Satanism, Judaism, Christianity, and this new cult that's going to bring about the end of the world, which you know, so the world can be reborn and all this crazy stuff. And that this includes murdering people, terrorizing people, sacrificing people um and they're serious about this and um there is some connection uh, there, there there are a lot of cults there's the oto and then crowley starts his own branch of the oto the aa and so they kind of recruit from each other's memberships and and like the de grimstons come to america and they're kind of proselytizing their new cult um, among members of existing cults in the united states but we actually found an actual cult, um, and these were things – you know, Maury found – between Maury and Ed Sanders, who had written the by far the best book about the Manson family, there's also this cult that he was sniffing around and finds all these clues, can't quite nail down, and he comes to the conclusion it's the solar lodge of the OTO. But again, it's this cult called the Children, and it's – According to legend, it started by this woman who speaks with a British accent. She has red hair. She has these certain beliefs, and then her cult is called it in prophesizing the end of the world and sacrificing specific dogs, Doberman pinchers or Alsatian dogs, or not not Doberman pinchers, Alsatian or German, German shepherd dogs. Yeah. Right. Well, it turns out there was a cult, is a cult called the Children which was started by a red-haired woman who sometimes spoke with an English accent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are things that we've been able to put together. And, and it's, just, it's just a tragedy that Maury passed away when he did because he went to his grave trying to warn people about, about this cult, and he just couldn't quite prove it to the degree that we've been able to do with actual concrete evidence. So the so. children wasn't the same as the process church. It's not – Mary de Grimston, they, right? Are you saying? Right. They had like overlapping, overlapping members, yeah. right. right? They had overlapping members. And so, and I'm not letting the de Grimstons off the hook by any stretch of the imagination, but there really is very specifically a cult called the children. And this gotcha. goes way okay, to the forties and fifties. Right. And it, it explains a lot of the things Maury couldn't quite explain about the connections between this cult and the New York show business and fashion industries and things like that. So, and what was the children's ideology? Do you know what their kind of 
particular strain of occultism was? They come from the Pasadena Lodge of the OTO, the Ordo Templis Orientalis, which was the order that Crowley had joined, and then he kind of goes off and forms his own order. Um, Jack Parsons is a famous member of this cult and who was probably assassinated. Um, and they, so they're kind of a branch of that, and they recruit new members. They bring in members. They're kind of a rival to the Solar Lodge. Have, um, you, have you ever heard of the Agape Lodge? That was, that was Parsons Lodge in Pasadena. Right. And that's, the and that's the one. So a lot of these people come originally from there. And when Jack dies, then they kind of go off. Some of them are recruited into this other cult by this woman. Um, very specifically, like they believed that you needed to find your, what they would call soulmate would be like your, your kindred animal spirit, your familiar spirit. And this will be inhabiting an Alsatian dog. And you sacrifice this dog in a certain ritual, and then you combine those two spirits, and now, you, now you're a much more powerful entity yourself. And it's interesting because those two letters that Berkowitz supposedly wrote but probably didn't, where the narrator calls himself, I'm a son of Sam, he's describing himself as a dog in the first letter, a dog owned by Sam Carr apparently. Then in the second letter, he's this new – it's kind of a new personality where he has been fused with this human spirit, this human soul in this new, much more powerful. And it, it goes right along with what what the, the children apparently believed and practiced as well. And were the children networked within uh, New York High Society? Well, for example, you know? there's a connection between some of the Son of Sam murders and the Ford Modeling Agency, the big modeling agency in New York City. And the founders and some of the top, top models, managers in the Ford Modeling Agency were members of, specifically of the children. Fascinating. Gotcha. No, so definitely. Yeah, that was the biggest name in New York at some at one point, wasn't it? Well, for yeah, modeling? And, and for example, Berkowitz and his – Prison buddies, they had to kind of use these code names for people in the cult because they didn't want – Berkowitz came within less than an inch of his life. Uh, somebody tried to bump him off. Uh, yeah, I somebody think he tried to slit his throat, right? Right. I think while well, he's in Danamora and – because he's been communicating with people including Maury Terry and dropping these hints and trying to help their investigations. But he's not helping too much. He claims, you know – I want to stay alive. My father's life is in danger. And, and I think he was right because some of these people lived like within a couple of blocks of Berkowitz's dad in Florida. Wow. So, so he's attacked, almost dies. So they move him to Attica. Uh, and then there are two other guys there who, who also know about this cult and had kind of been involved in this. Um, and over the years, other people, uh, uh, who who were involved in it, recruited into it, and got out of it. They they've also come forward with information. So, um, for example, like they call call this one guy uh, Rodan the Flying Monster and Roy Rogers, and then he has this friend Dale Evans. Well, these are code names for Roy Raiden, uh, the Hollywood producer Robert Evans, and all these people. Well, one of the code names for Ronald Sisman, one of the guys who eventually gets murdered, he and a model friend of his they call him sissy spacek and it's not just because it rhymes with sisman sissy spacek originally when she went to new york she was a folk singer at and she was signed with roulette records which is owned by the mob and she's a model at the ford agency and she's working with stylists and photographers like michael carr and ronald sisman like she does know some of these people and we're not saying she's up to her knees in this cult. It's just that she runs in the same circles. circles and, right. right. And she's kind of typical of, and the acting school, she went to Strasbourg acting studio and a lot of the instructors there, they were Scientologists and some of them apparently were also members of this. There's this cult that it even predates, uh, uh, even predates the children, this Westchester County, uh, this Harold Untermeyer, Right, this uh, rich money bags who dies and leaves this mansion and grounds and becomes this park 
Untermeyer Park where this cult meets and they sacrifice dogs and apparently sacrificing people and, and raping people and doing all these horrible things in Untermeyer Park. Well, this Untermeyer himself was apparently some kind of a cultist back in the day. So these, these threads run really deep. Right. No, the park uh, itself is laid out. It has all kinds of occult symbology and it's laid oh, sure. out on occult uh, specific. So it's it's not a surprise that current modern occultists would be attracted to that place. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of like graffiti and stuff, including a smiley face, all kinds of crazy stuff. So uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a, like this grotto where there's a satanic little temple that these people have set up and doing things. And we're talking, you know, undercover cops have been witnesses to these things. These are not just rumors going around. And I think I know over a hundred carcasses of of murdered and mutilated uh, dogs, uh, particularly German shepherds, have been found in and around the park over the years. I know right. it's a lot. And it's you'll lot. see that. There's uh, pictures, tons of uh, pictures of the Process Church with their dogs. That was their dog right. of choice. So there's some kind of That's overlapping right. thing. Crowley himself said, you know, join every occult order you can find. So current modern occultists, whether it's Robert Anton Wilson, they would join every a cold order of druid, OTO, masons, everything, you know, learn everything. They That's right. And they jump around. That's right. So it's, it's not that it's and not. For example, Sorry, please continue. Yeah. Well, I just uh, like the Freemasons and I'm not accusing all Freemasons of being evil, but within Freemasonry, there are secret orders. And if you're not a member of that, you can be a Mason, you can be a 33rd degree Mason. But if you're not a member of that particular secret order, you don't know anything that goes on in that group. Right. So, uh, right. And you have people who they get bored with one cult and they join another one or they go off and start their own or they get recruited into another one. Um, so there's a lot of overlapping membership uh, and they kind of die out and then somebody comes along and gets it going again in that community or. Right. And what was what was the Manson prosecutor that uh, the guy who wrote Helter Skelter was Vincent Bugliosi. He wrote about right. like the for the Process Church visiting Manson, and that Ed Sanders book you mentioned about. He got sued by the Process and had to That's take right. a full chapter out of his book. That's right. That's right. So, um, and it turns out uh, again that yes, there were people probably who were in the Process Church, but there is this specific cult right. called the Children. That's fast. Um, that's the first time I've ever heard of that. So that's amazing. No, I believe it. I mean, there were other things like there were rumors of Manson being associated with the solar cult, the solar lodge of the OTO outside of USC. Never confirmed, but rumored to be a visitor there. So, and he, uh, and, Manson himself knew he went into Scientology. Somebody went into a Scientology center with him and they said, You can't learn anymore. You've learned everything about Scientology. So he was very much more occulted than I think a lot of people know. Oh, and and we're going we're about to get into uh we're going to we can't do the whole Manson thing just this year. There's that's that's the rabbit hole of all rabbit holes. But his uh one some of the things we're going to cover is how intelligent he was, what kind of training he got while he was in prison. It's no coincidence he was in a particular federal penitentiary it's no coincidence he had a particular psychiatrist while he was there wow um right we're talking about people from other murder cults all being quote unquote treated by by this one prison shrink at this one federal prison are you willing to and, say to state his name um you know what off the top of my head i don't remember but we will be talking about it on the stones unturned podcast and i don't have those notes but right he in was in jail somewhere in california right uh manson yes, was he had right uh the, the two the two federal prisons he spent most of his time in were uh mcneil island and terminal island terminal island was kind of almost a halfway house so when some offenders would go into the federal prisons, see, Manson was always very careful to make sure when he got locked up again, he always went back to a federal pen. And it came as a tremendous shock and surprise to him when he was sent to San Quentin instead of being sent back to McNeil Island. Because right. McNeil Island was basically his home. I mean, it was his college. It was his home. 
uh, it, it, he had all his teachers there. He had a psychiatrist there, and he fully expected to be sent back there. Cause in those days, federal prison wasn't nearly as bad as state prison. And so, um, so he, when he was at McNeil Island, uh, he and his fellow patients with this one particular shrink, uh, there's a long and very interesting history there. But there's a lot of, I mean, California, if you look at these separate cases, there's so many people involved in MK Ultra and weird programming in California. And you read these books about Donald DeFries, his handler outside of Sacramento. You That's read right. Operation Chaos by O'Neill about Manson and all this stuff. These guys were tinkering around with people in jails. And it was, uh, yeah, who was it? Whitey Bulger was one of the early MK Ultra victims in Alcatraz. I sure. mean, it's just incredible sure. stories. So it's not surprising at sure. all that Manson had these connections. Yeah. Well, and you have this pattern. You have, um, first you have the diggers and you have, um, the, uh, the um there are two motorcycle you know, motorcycle gangs play a lot in this too you've got not just the hell's angels but you have the gypsy jokers and the jokers from hell on the west coast these are the psycho biker gangs these are the horror movie biker gangs an fbi plant in the gypsy jokers i think it's gypsy joker no it might be satan slaves he's he's a a, a manson family member oh, remarkable. right he's kind of infiltrated that but you these real psycho motorcycle gangs and they are associated with the children wow. and then on the east coast you have satan slaves and satan's choice who are associated with this cult in untermeyer park that berkowitz is apparently tangled up in wow. and you have right so you have and the hell's angels themselves were started by Guys from World War II in the Pacific who were in and out of the OSS, the CIA, who had been in the Pacific since long before America got involved, since it, even before 1937. Some of this goes back to the Spanish-American War in the Philippines. That's how far back a lot of this goes. Wow, so cool. you have – so you've got this stuff going on. Then you get Zodiac, right, who's writing these letters and cryptograms to the newspaper, and that's – I don't want to – go into that whole thing right now, but it's like there's signals, right? He's sending coded messages. It's like the ghost signal to some kind of sleeper cell. Right. And the right. Faith, the smiling yeah. face of the skeleton. So you've got the smiley face. Right. And there, then all you that get, stuff, yeah. that kind of peters out. And right after that, you get Manson. Well, you get right about the same time as Manson. There are so many so-called coincidences between the Zodiac killer letters and Manson. It's not funny. It's like, Right, there, it's a signal to start helter skelter. Well, that kind of fizzles out. So the next thing you get is the death angels, sometimes called the zebra murders. Right, right? Yes. supposedly these are racially motivated. They're really, it's really Muslims killing white Christians, but it's black on white violence, which is supposed to start helter skelter. This is from seventy two, seventy four. This peters out, and a few weeks later, you get the Symbionese Liberation Army. Right, and that peters out, and then you get son of Sam. And then that peters out. And then, and in between all this, you've got Sirhan Sirhan shooting Robert Kennedy. You right. It's one, one right after the other, one right constant after. tension, constant psychic and driving of society. These people all did time. Some of these guys did time in the same jail cell. That's Not incredible. only did they have the same shrink or the same handlers and they were in same jail cell. Yeah, and like Donald DeFries knew like the he knew I mean he guy was a, like totally operated inside and outside of jail. And he knew that uh girl that he Hearst he knew Patty or uh, Patty Hearst while he was in jail. So he knew her and that That's was right. never disclosed. That's the Brad Schreiber book. Highly recommend that book by the way. And also Well, you've got book. yeah, yeah, uh Mention that again for the audience in the title of the book. Do you know the title the of the book? The title of the book, it's a long title of Schreiber's book, but I think Tom O'Neill's book it just got published, which I highly recommend that read. There's a lot of stunning information about Jolly and West and these guys all connected with each other. But uh, yeah, and then you that's got Operation Park Chaos, Thompson. supposedly run right. by um, James Jesus Angleton. So. Yeah, and you've got Philip Arthur Thompson, the same thing, in and out of jail, Working for the CIA, working for the DEA, working for right, playing all sides against the middle. Right. Yeah, well, DeFreeze, you one of the giveaways of DeFreeze is that he could not find one African American follower. 
And so they kind of sniffed him out that something was amiss, that a lot of that his shtick wasn't legit, you know. But yeah. the, the other one, sorry, sorry to interrupt. And then, well, and then you've got Reverend Jim Jones coming out of San Francisco. Wow, that's amazing. You put all this together, it's just an amazing, you know, one after the other, just incredible events. That's right. So, so what, uh, so are you, will? do you know the name of the person who was the head of the children at the time of Absolutely. the son of Sam? Okay, so you know her name. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um <laughs> What we're doing on the show, we're starting over, which is what I like to do anyway. Okay. So we're we're re-reviewing the entire Son of Sam thing, and we're looking at you know we're following Maury's book fairly closely, but we're adding new information, we're correcting things he might have got wrong, and now we're getting close to the point where we're going to have to go down the Manson rabbit hole, and of course we're going to have to talk about the murder of Arliss Perry, and again these are this was a murder that Berkowitz had claimed was linked to this cult. And I know you know something about that. And we're going to talk right. you into coming on our show sometime to talk because there's this new evidence. There's DNA and there's there's some other stuff coming out about Arliss Perry. Right. And there was recently that, a guy who supposedly killed himself. He was under investigation in San Jose and had some right. connection to it. But my if, if people want to read my article that I published in 2016 about Arliss Perry, the title is The Process, Crowley Moss, and the unsolved murder of Arliss Perry. You can just type that into Google. It'll pop up. But uh, the whole thing was totally ritualized and all kinds of crazy stuff was going on. Oh, it was, it was absolutely someone, and, and I may have some information for you. I think I know who organized that right. sacrifice of Arliss Perry and what the purpose was. you got to understand, these people believe in this stuff. Yes. Some of them do. Some of them use it to control people, but some of them, they, they have these wizard wars on the astral plane and innocent people get murdered as part of, of this game that they, that they're playing. And, and, uh, that's what, that's what happened to her. And. Right. And it's not just one random guy who does this. So Steve Crawford, who's, He'd been a cop, and his brother was a cop right next door, the little town right next to Palo Alto. His brother was a cop. Uh, he's retired now. Do you know they what city it was, Menlo Park, or what? Do you know? Was oh, it uh, it's, it's, university? It's, yeah. As a matter of fact, he lived a couple of blocks from the city limits. If you go southeast down the main drag of Palo Alto, what's that next little town? East Palo Alto? Mount or Pleasant. Mount Pleasant. Mount Pleasant? No, that's not right. It's either it's either Menlo Park or Mount Prospect. No, it's Mount something. Mountain View. Mountain, Mountain Valley, View. Mountain. Yes, Mountain View. Mountain View. Yeah. Right. His brother was a cop in Mountain View. Yeah, that's pretty close. And Steve gets fired from being a cop, so he becomes a security guard uh, at the at Stanford, and he's the one who supposedly had locked up the church. And then when he comes back, he notices there's a door open. He goes in and finds the body. So he's, he's been a suspect forever and a day. Um, and there were at least two people actually physically assaulting and murdering her. She'd been assaulted, sexually assaulted with a candle from the altar of the church. And there's a palm print on that candle. And the one thing that saved him from Crawford from being arrested and charged was that's not his palm print. It's wow. somebody else's. Did you ever hear the rumor that she was actually found on the altar of the church and that her body was moved? I seen photographs. She was behind a pew. Well, she might right. The death might have occurred on the altar. That's possible. But what you see, and I don't want to get too gross details on what kind of rating I have for your show, but it's a it's a crowley it's it's totally somebody's an avid devotee of Crowley, and that brings up a one particular person who arranged for this to happen. But there's her her it has to be her because she's a, a devout Christian who had been proselytizing Christianity among some of these cult members, and it's important to these cult members. They believe that we basically choose our own destiny. She chose to be there. She chose to be the sacrificial lamb in this. Uh, uh, sacrifice and so on and so forth, even though she might not have specifically volunteered to do that in their minds, she was asking for it kind of thing. And there are all these details 
that add up to, you know, it's definitely an occult sacrifice. Yeah, it's, it's on Crowley Moss, Crowley's birthday, October 12th. Yeah. That's right. That's Midnight, right. On October yeah, 12th. Yeah. And, and like going back to the Son of Sam murders, and it isn't just Son of Sam. Uh, it's not just the two murders, Donna Loria and Stacey Moskowitz. Those are on July 29th. But the mysterious death of the singer Mama Cass Elliot from the Mamas and the Papas. She's, she dies on July 29th. Wow. Um, uh, uh, there is the murder of Gary Hinman uh, by the Manson family on July 29th. And this, incredible. But, but just incredible. Right, one specifically weird belief of this particular cult is, and including the processes, they worship Adolf Hitler as the son of Satan, just in the same way that Jesus is the son of God. And they believe that. They also believe Adolf Hitler was the son of Satan. And so they worship Hitler, and some of the members believe they are the reincarnation of top Nazis like Heinrich Himmler, Joseph Goebbels. Uh, I've heard that. I've heard that somewhere. So yeah. July 29th was the day that Hitler was acclaimed as der Führer, the leader of the German Workers' Party. And that means more to them than his birthday or the day that he becomes chancellor of Germany. The day he is proclaimed to fear, right. that, and that's July 29th. Have you ever heard that the, the whole thing with the um, dogs is the same as with the SS where they take an animal and raise it and then at a certain point the SS commander says kill the dog you raised? And they have to kill it right. again. And is that really? Did you see that similarity between that and the cult? Absolutely. Oh, okay. And okay. some yeah. some of the SS Hitler was not quite as much into the occult as as Heinrich Himmler. Adolf Hitler was not quite as much. He was coached and he was mentored by these members of the Tula Society, these Aryan supremacist, uh, uh, you know, all that pagan mumbo jumbo. But then Himmler, Heinrich Himmler, and a lot of the senior members and Rank and file members of the SS, they're much more into the occult. There's this, you can see this documentary on YouTube. Uh, it's called the Temp the Nazi Temple of Doom, where they really get into this. Yeah, Babelsberg, yes, Black Sun, yes, they, right? Yeah, right. And they pervert all of this into their death cult. And so, yes, so these people, some members of the process, some members of the children, they worship these dead Nazis. Some of them believe that they are the reincarnation of dead Nazis. Yeah, they get a name. I think they, in the process, they get a name of the former Nazi right. that they were, if I remember correctly. But it's interesting that uh, Himmler had a 12,000 book uh, library of all occult works. Okay. And and Hitler himself had one by a guy named Schertl that was very similar to Crowley. And he had, and I put include this in my book, Children of the Beast, but he had leafed it and underlined it and put things in. So you know that he had read this occult manuscript at least once Absolutely. with great interest. And they had Absolutely. his library. It was a great loss because somebody ripped off his library that was at, I think, one of the Wolf's Lairs or something like that. And some of that stuff was lost. So you don't know the totality of what he was reading. But they say that Hitler would go home and read a book real fast before he went to bed every night at different Yeah, and, right. And he believed a lot of it. Himself. And if you – it's weird because you could understand why he believed it over and over and over again in his life. The, the First World War, he had survived 27 major assassination attempts. Everything he did turned out, you know, came up roses. So you begin to believe you are some kind of chosen, infallible leader. You know, you, you it just and, – and it's, it's weird because he saw himself as the reincarnation of Frederick the Great. And what's weird about that is Hitler, Hitler thought the only mistake Germany made in the First World War was giving up at the last minute. He didn't think there was anything wrong with the slaughter, the destruction. He thought that was – that's evolution. That strengthens the race. That purifies the race. He believed right up to the last minute that, that this miracle would happen, and this time instead of giving in at the last second like they did in 1918, if they just stuck to their guns for a few more days. And in April of 1945, Franklin Delano Roosevelt drops dead, and Hitler going around saying, see, 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 I told you. Because that's what happened. The Russians were just about to crush Germany under Frederick the Great when Catherine the Great suddenly dropped dead and the Russian army went home and it saved Germany. And Hitler, right, his whole entire life up to that moment that the Russians are banging on the door and he, he, he puts a 
you know, eats a bullet. Right up to that moment, he really thought that these things were going to come true. So, yeah, and crazy. and he has followers now. Most of the members of the SS, when they heard Hitler committed suicide, took the coward's way out. It kind of took the wind out of their sails. But there are members of this cult who believe, well, that's what Hitler did. So that's what I should do at that moment of crisis. The best way: don't let your enemies kill you. When it comes down to it, you take your own life. That's how you become a god. Interesting. It's so it's, strange. It's their belief system is so bizarre. <laughs> it would be. Laughable, except that how we we don't know how many people have been murdered over this. We right. know it's does well. Hundreds. You can see their documents. I mean, you can see at least the process documents use the swastika, and sure. uh, you know they feature famous people. They had uh, oh, Mick Jagger and uh, Jimmy Savile and all these other characters at least publicly. You know, it's pretty weird. You don't know who privately. Well, it's like Scientology. If you can yeah. recruit these celebrities, it gives you credibility, right? Right, right. and yeah. it gives you access. To other rich celebrities. Now, there's a lot of just plain old uh, uh, fraud going on there, and then they start blackmailing rich people, and they get to their kids, like maybe Abigail Folger, like these other, like Patty Hearst, right? right, right. And then you use them to get money from the parents and do things like that. So yeah. every um, member of uh, Scientology is blackmailed. They all have given information to the group. That would be very deleterious if it was ever exposed. So that's why some people have to stay in to at least publicly state they're still in Scientology. Oh, sure. I don't know if you want me to say this on the air, but I know two other <laughs> supposedly respectable religions who do exactly the same thing. Go Pro ahead. Stay away. I, I, I won't get into trouble. Well, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commonly known as the Mormons, they do exactly the same thing. When those missionaries come into your house— and I've recorded them doing this. They'll come in and they'll ask to go to the bathroom or whatever. They snoop. And then really if you if you start getting interested and you join the church, they hold that stuff over you. And another one, it's very they're they're related. They came out of the same movement. The Seventh Day Adventists do the same thing. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised at any of that stuff. You know, you want to get into the occult history of Joseph Smith. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other story. Yeah. Anyway, a fascinating discussion. We're at about 50 minutes. People, again, I would highly recommend people check out this podcast, The Stones Unturned. The Son of Sam case has a lot more connection. It goes way deeper than one supposed lone killer, that whole phony narrative that was talked about uh, about uh, this guy, whatever his name is. But uh, anyway, is there anything that I missed, anything you want want to add before we wrap this up? Um, just to put in another plug for our show, we're about to get into the, the unsolved murder of this young lady named Jody LaCornu. Um, she's an identical twin. Her sister is still out there trying to get this case solved. We think we've uncovered two uh, major new leads uh, in the Jody LaCornu case in Baltimore, Maryland, 1996. We're about to start uh, the episodes on that. And then we're going to uh, and then we're going to interview Kevin Sullivan, uh, Ted Bundy. You have no idea how much you don't know about Ted Bundy. Um, he's more fascinating than, than I ever imagined. And then we're going to uh, get into some of the Manson family stuff. And then, cause we found this concrete evidence that really does prove Maury Terry, right? There really is this absolute concrete link between the son of Sam murders, Manson family, Arliss Perry and others uh, that, that we're eventually going to get to. But first you have to understand details of all these cases. All right, cool. Well, I look forward to seeing that. I'm definitely going to be fascinated to hear how those two cases link together. So again, it's Thomas Henry Horan, H O R A N. And the podcast, again, is The Stones, plural, The Stones Unturned Podcast. Thomas, thank you very much. Thank you so much, William. All right, cool.